I accepted Jesus Christ as my savior as an 18 year old freshman in college and Jesus Christ changed my life. It was in a service just like this. I stepped out and bowed at the front and told a holy God I was not a holy person and asked him if he would come into my life and save me and Jesus totally changed me. And about three months later, to my total astonishment, I felt like he was calling me to be a preacher. So in, that was uh, 1955, so in September of 1955, I got a 1949 maroon Ford and drove from Odessa, Texas to Springfield and became a student at Baptist Bible College. But I also joined the High Street Baptist Church. They were down at High End Prospect. I came from a small church, and I stepped into a church kind of like what you've got going on now. It was full Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. The music was great. I was just overwhelmed. I asked for a Sunday school class. They gave me a class of nine-year-old boys. I sang in the choir, sang in a young men's quartet, and I look back all these years later, I mean, for 36 years, I pastored the largest church in Odessa, Texas, and I've done, I had the opportunity to speak a lot, but my heart is filled with gratitude this morning for the High Street Baptist Church who took a kid who hadn't been saved a year and loved me and gave me a job in the church and set a fire within me that never went out. Everything we did in Odessa and we had, as I said, the largest church in town and we're over 3,000 for 25 years on special days. Over four. All of that happened because of the High Street Baptist Church. And I want to tell you guys who are a part of this church, you young students, you college students, let this church put something in you that will uh, guide your days. Okay, commercial's over. <laughs> Title of the message this morning is The Lure of the Hobo. Lure means attraction. Hobo is kind of the, this old carefree life where you just, you know, it's, you're not under all this pressure. It's the lure. I might call it the desire to get away from it all. And I want to encourage you this morning because I don't care if you're young or old, life's not always easy. Marriage, for you that are married, marriage is not always easy. Raising kids is not always easy. Your job is not always easy. For you that are in school, it, was not all, it is not always easy, and the church is not always easy. And because life is not easy, in life there are a lot of quitting places. So as a good Texan, I'm going to begin this message with a few words from my favorite country singer who is Merle Haggard. Some of you know him, God bless you. Uh, Merle, one of his early songs was called Working Man Blues. And in this song, it speaks of something which hits most of our hearts at one time or another. It tells of a hardworking man, and here are the words. Merle said, it's a big job just getting by with nine kids and a wife. But I've been a working man dang near all my life, so I'll go back working long as my hands are fit to use. Then he said, I drink a little beer in the tavern and sing a little bit of these working man blues. Okay, ignore that, drink a little beer in the tavern, okay? That didn't come from me, that came from Merle, don't you do that. Then Merle said this, it's on your screen. He said, sometimes I think about leaving, do a little bumming around. I wanna throw my bills out the window and catch a train to another town. Well, most of us have these moments in life, we just like to get away from it all. We get discouraged, Time of, tired of the same old grind, convinced we're just going in circles, same old job, same old wife, same old husband, same old school, same old kids, same old house, same old church. And it's tempting to think about running away from what we're doing now. And don't think you're the only one who thinks like that. Our hero in the sermon this morning is Jeremiah. Jeremiah is one of the great greatest men in the Bible. He was a prophet for God in Israel for almost 50 years. For you that have been around church some, let me say it this way, he was the preacher who influenced Daniel, the three Hebrew children, and Ezekiel. 
But when we find him this morning, he is discouraged. It's on your screen. Jeremiah said, chapter 9, verse 2. Oh, that I had in the desert a lodging place for travelers, that I could leave my people and go away from them. Sounds like Merle. Sometimes I think about leaving. Uh, Jeremiah said, I, I just wish I could go run a, like a motel in the mountains of Colorado. He was down in the dumps. He wanted to resign, quit preaching. And as I said, go run a little motel. But that's a temptation that overtakes all of us. There are days we would like to get lost. Everyone has quitting places. Uh, to the pastor, which I pastored all those years, Monday mornings sometimes were hard. I mean, the message didn't go that well. The attendance was down. The offerings were down. Nobody's moving at invitation time. Everybody griping about something. So it's easy to say, I quit on Monday morning. I had no boy say one time to me, he was a pastor. He, he wasn't, I didn't know him really very well, but he just kind of put his finger in my face and said, let me tell you something, Brother Thorpe. I have never quit on Monday morning. Have you ever quit on Monday morning? I said, oh yeah, I've quit on Monday morning. I've also quit on Monday afternoon, Monday evening, Tuesday, and every other day in the week. I was walking down the aisle one day in our church and I was shaking hands, saw a guy I didn't know before. So I said, we're really glad to have you. Is this your mother with you? And he said, no, this is my wife. Now, I challenge any of you to have anything intelligent to say at that moment. <laughs> I just walked away saying, God, I'm too dumb to pastor a church. Let me go run a motel out in Colorado with Jeremiah. But thankfully, listen to me, success in life doesn't always depend on you being perfect. Sometimes success depends on how you handle discouragement how you handle the desire to get away from it all, the lure of the hobo. I wonder how many, uh, perhaps you, have missed God's best for your life because you got discouraged and you run away, you quit and ran away in time of trouble. So I'm going to talk to you this morning about dreams. I'm going to talk to you about disappointments. I'm going to talk to you about determination. First of all, dreams. Now, Jeremiah began with an incredible touch of God on his life. Look at it on your screen, Jeremiah 1. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, now read that, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart as a prophet to the nations. That's pretty heady stuff. For God to say, before you were ever conceived by your mom and dad, I knew about you, I planned your life, this is what I want you to do. And before we go further, could I throw something out to a lot of younger people here? Because an abortion's a big issue in our nation. If what God did for Jeremiah is true for every child, if God looks at every child and said, before you were ever conceived, I knew you, I have a plan for your life, we need to be careful how we interrupt that kind of thing. So when God says, Jeremiah, I got big plans for you. Uh, well, that's what most of us begin our early years with big, big dreams. We will have wonderful school years. I will grow up. I'll get a marriage. It'll be perfect. I'll never have an argument. I'll find a fulfilling job that pays well and gives me the opportunity to live well and travel constantly. We dream our parents will always be with us. Our health will always be good. Our children will turn out perfect. Quitting is never in our early vocabulary because we dream about how we want life to be. But life doesn't always turn out the way we plan. And Jeremiah's dreams of being a prophet of God did not come to pass the way he thought it would. And when your dreams are not realized, then we come to second point, which is disappointment. Life doesn't always turn out the way we dream. We don't dream a far too early marriage or four kids in five years or a divorce 
or a fatal or crippling accident or an economic slowdown. And the list can be quite long of things that can devastate our dreams. When president of these United States, Jimmy Carter said once, life is not fair. And he's right. Life is not fair. Well, there were several things that troubled Jeremiah. First of all, his job had not turned out the way he thought it would. There are many in the Bible, if, you, if you've been around church and you read your Bible, there's a lot of people in the Bible who were eagerly looking forward to what God gave them to do. In Isaiah chapter 6, God said, I want somebody to go for me. And Isaiah said, hey, you got him right here. I'm your man. When Jesus Christ was calling his disciples, Peter and Andrew were fishermen. The Lord said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And the Bible said straightway they left their nets and followed him. So did Matthew, the tax collector. But not Moses. God called Moses and said, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said, whoa, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Or Jeremiah, here again on your screen. God said, I've called you to be a prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah said, ah, sovereign Lord, I do not know how to speak. I'm only a child. I don't think I can do this. Second thought, Jeremiah was tired of unreasonable people. Jeremiah was a good man. He had a very tender heart. I, I read again before this message when I preached, it's over 50 chapters in Jeremiah. We call him the weeping prophet. He had a very tender heart. But he was preaching to a hard-headed group of people in Israel who were on the brink of King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army coming down and wiping them out. And God had told Jeremiah, preach that to the people. But the people were living fine and they ignored that and ignored him. And Jeremiah described his crowd as traitors, slanderers, compromisers. And he was right. May I tell you early in your life, one of the greatest burdens of life is dealing with unreasonable people. The apostle Paul prayed to be delivered from unreasonable men, nitpickers, small-minded, cantankerous. We all have them. When I was a kid preacher, before I went to Odessa and stayed over 50 years from all my years there, I went to El Paso. Freddie and I, uh, my wife, She's here this morning. Freddie's a girl. Just, she's here. So I just say that to make sure you know where we are on that. Uh, I went and took a little church in El Paso, Texas. Uh, it was, uh, I was 25 years old. I was green as a gourd. I knew God wanted me to do something, and I was charged up and ready to go. And here's a church. It's an unpainted cinder block building. It's on a sand hill. There were 40 people there that morning. They had a $9 offering. They called me to be their pastor, set my salary at $15 a week. I had Freddie. We had one child, one on the way. And I took that church. You know something, guys? I went to work. I'm just a kid preacher. I'm knocking doors. I'm trying to win people to the Lord, and good things begin to happen. The church began to grow, and I was, we was winning some of the biggest reprobates in the lower valley of El Paso. Old Moss Redeker on Saturday night was at a honky-tonk with his son, and they got in a fight, and he broke a beer bottle over the head of his son on Saturday night. But his wife, Pearl, talked him into coming to that little church on Sunday morning. And when I preached, Moss walked up, took me by the hand and said, Preacher, I need the Lord so bad. And we knelt at the altar and Moss Redeker got saved. And then his son got saved. And Charlie Winters, his wife, came and told me, said, Jerry, he's the biggest, meanest drunk in the lower valley of El Paso. Would you come see him? I don't know how he'll treat you. He's pretty mean and rough. So I took Freddie with me in case things got rough over there. And I was talking to Charlie. He was, I'm, I'm a 140 pound then, crew cut, sunburned nose. And I'm in this giant of a guy who's the biggest, roughest guy. And I'm just telling him about the Lord Jesus. And he's arguing with me. I'm too mean to be saved. I'm too sorry. Preacher, you don't know what I've done. 
But I read him Isaiah, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And Charlie bought that and we got on our knees and Charlie got saved. And the church was just electrified and we were growing and doing good. And one Sunday we had 75 and then we set a goal for 100 and we had 100. And we thought we were the biggest church in the world. And we were just rejoicing. And after that service, an old boy walked up to me, put his finger on my nose and he said, do you know what's wrong with you? I said, probably not, but I think you're fixing to tell me. He said, you're right. What's wrong with you is you preach too much evangelism. You need to feed the sheep. And you know what he did? He cut the legs right out from under me. He said, you're spending too much time trying to get people saved. You need to just feed the sheep. Somebody told me later, I should have told him, you can't feed a dead sheep. All you can do is skin it. Somebody's always telling me later what I should have said right at that moment. But you know what? He chopped me down. And I learned there are a lot of unreasonable people in life. And they will wear you down. Huh. My son Alan is a girls, I had girls basketball coach at a high school level in Granbury, Texas, where many, some of you kids are from. And he's a great young man, and he's a great coach, and he loves the girls, and they have a great, they work hard, they play hard, he's doing a good job. And he told me one day, he said, Dad, coaching the girls is the greatest job in the world, but he said, I'm telling you, some parents drive me crazy, helicopter parents. Their daughter could be four feet tall, weigh 230 pounds, couldn't run out of sight in a week, think you dribble a basketball with your head, but her parents think she is LeBron James's little sister. And the only reason he doesn't win state every year is because they don't play his little dumpling. And the, and the parents can drive him crazy. Alan asked me one day, he said, Dad, you know the greatest place to coach? I said, I probably not. He said, an orphanage. <laughs> But there are unreasonable people. And Jeremiah was tired of dealing with unreasonable people. And can I say a word about your pastor? I love Eddie. We've been friends for a million years. I knew him before he and Cindy got married when he was in the Philippines. Eddie's the greatest guy. He's, I don't know, you know all of this. But, and you say, well, Eddie, look, he's, look, this church is doing great. Everything's going good. I bet nobody's griping. Yeah, somebody's griping. Somebody's fussing, somebody don't like something, or they're mad about something, and the, and the preacher bears all of that. Uh, you know what Eddie needs from you? He needs what I had in, in Odessa. I had a doctor there, and he'd come up to me on Sunday morning, and he'd put his arm around me and he'd say, is anybody bothering you, preacher? No, doc, nobody's bothering me. He walked up one morning and said, you need anybody killed? He said, you know, I'm packing. I said, yeah, I know you're packing, but I don't need anybody killed. He said, I just want you to know I love you and appreciate you. Eddie needs somebody like that. Just put your arm around him and say, Eddie, man, you carry a big load. What you're doing is incredible. Be a, be a help to him. Jeremiah got tired of unreasonable people. And then third, Jeremiah wanted to get away from trouble. It's not fun to have a congregation turn on you like they turned on Jeremiah. Look at the verse on your screen. He said, alas, my mother, that you gave me birth. I wish I'd have never been born a man with whom the whole land strives and contends. I made a little list. I mean, the nation of Israel treated his ministry of warning about the Babylonian empire like it was a joke. Uh, uh, Jeremiah hired a scribe who dictated all of his sermons on whatever material they used in those days. And he took a stack of it to the king of Israel and the king read a page and threw it in the fire and read a page and threw it in the fire. They stoned him out of his hometown. He was arrested for vagrancy. They humiliated him by putting in the public stocks. He was whipped. He was in and out of jails. He was thrown in a filthy abandoned well. Jeremiah had done his best to represent God well. He had warned Israel day and night of coming judgment, but it was all unheeded. His messages were ignored. His ministry appeared fruitless. His life seemed useless. 
and no one followed Jeremiah. Here's another verse on your screen. He said, I never sat in the company of revelers. I never went to parties. Never made merry with them. I sat alone because your hand was upon me and you had filled me with indignation. In short, Jeremiah felt like he was a failure. You ever feel like that? Feel like you're kind of going in circles? So no wonder Jeremiah wanted to get away from it all. He wanted to go out and run a little motel somewhere. But did he run away? No, he didn't. He wanted to. Everybody would have been happy to see him go. They would have helped him pack. But he stayed. For over 40 years he stayed. And so should you. Which brings me to my last thought. Determination. When you get discouraged, when you go, why should you stay? Well, I want you to know life is filled with quitting places. In the years that I was in Odessa, I was, among the other things I did in the community, I was the head chaplain of the Odessa Permian football team, Mojo, who in the 70s and the 80s and the first part of the 90s was the winningest football program high school program in the state of Texas. And I talked to those kids all the time before those big games. And I always talked to them about quitting. Games are won or lost because somebody doesn't quit. You're going to come to the last quarter. You're going to be exhausted. You're going to be defeated. It's easy to check it. It's easy to roll over. But the game's going to be won or lost in the last quarter because you absolutely refuse to quit. We had a, had a coach at Texas Tech spoke for our banquet one year, and he was talking about, he said, we were in the last quarter of our game, and, and the score was tied, and we were moving down the field, and I knew we had a chance to win that game. And he said, one of my best players, my tackle, came off the field. He was holding his helmet in his hand. Hair was plastered down with sweat, a trickle of blood down one side of his mouth, his eyes glazed with fatigue. And he said, coach, you got to get me out of there. They're beating the devil out of me. You got to get me out of there. Coach said, I had to have him. He's the best player I had. He said, I grabbed him by the shoulders and I shook him. And I said, son, listen to me. Think positive. Do you hear me? We've got a chance to win this game. Think positive. And he said, the kid said, Coach, I'm positive they're beating the devil out of me. You've got to get me out of there. Well, there are times in life when we're just positive. I need to go run a motel. So what keeps a person from quitting? What kept Jeremiah? Let's go back to Merle Haggard for a minute. Sometimes I think about leaving, do a little bumming around, I want to throw my bills out the window and catch a plane to another town. But I go back working. Why? I got to buy my kids a brand new pair of shoes. That's a sense of duty. That's responsibility. Someone is depending upon me, my wife, my husband, my children, my church, my pastor. God. The words I must are found in the vocabulary of men and women who are moral giants, not weaklings. They do great things not because they want to, but because they must. They are people who have plugged their ears to the whimperings of ease and laziness and shallowness and indifference. They are people who will not quit. When I was growing up, I was a big sports fan, and I read about these great football, basketball players. And I thought winners were people who never lost. I was wrong. I learned winners are not people who never lose. They're people who never quit. Haywood Hale Brun, who was a sports writer, caster for CBS said, winners are people who take their defeats, slam them to the ground, step on them and rise above them. Jeremiah had a sense of duty. He knew he was right because his life was based upon the word of God. For you that are parents here, has one of your teenagers ever said, come on, dad, you're the only parent who thinks like that. All the other kids can do this. You're the only parent that's that strict. 
as a married person? Are there people at your work, singles, or married people cheating on their mate that are telling you how much fun they're having? Did you ever have a stack of bills and the tithe is due? And you can get discouraged. Sometimes I think about leaving, do a little bumming around. So why don't you quit? Well, Jeremiah tried to. Here's another verse on your screen. Go along with me. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. I've done what God wanted me to do, but it hasn't worked. But if I say, I will quit, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name. His word is in my heart like a fire. It's like a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I can't. That church in Odessa I pastored 36 years. I had a little something that I was constantly challenging the church with. It was a quote by Friedrich Nietzsche, who's a German philosopher, atheist. But he said something really terrific. He said the only way to accomplish anything ultimately is a long obedience in the same direction. I tried to live by that. It's a long obedience in the same direction. It's refusing to quit. It's not getting discouraged and checking it. A long obedience in the same direction. When I retired, I think it'll be on your screen, they did a brochure, it's a very nice brochure, 36 years with it, but across the top, a long obedience in the same direction. The only way you make any difference ultimately in life is a long obedience in the same direction. In other words, you keep doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do and God is in it. Years ago, there was a teenage boy that sat where you sat at High Street, married a girl named Carol. His name was Jim Edge. God had called him to preach and he and his wife and three children wanted to go to Boston. Huge city, New England city. No one would support him. No church supported him. And they went. Uh, Jim told me he and Carol were staying in the cheapest apartment they could get. She was working, he was working. He said many times she went to the store and had $5 is all she had to buy groceries. One year at Christmas, we had homemade toys, but he stayed with it because God had sent him there. And this morning in the Marriott Hotel that he and I were talking, he had been there 25 years because he refused to quit. It's a long obedience in the same direction. Give me last verse on your screen. God made Jeremiah promise, just like, you've been singing about this stuff. Do you believe what you're singing? I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. God made Jeremiah promise. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people in the land. They will fight against you keep reading, but they will not overcome you. For I am with you. No matter where you go in life, whatever God wants you to do, if you can live those five words, I am with you. Let me close with an illustration. He was 17 years old and he was the apple of his dad's eye, but his brothers hated him. His name was Joseph. Incredible guy. He had a dream. 17 years old, he had a dream. Doesn't make any sense. His sheaf of weave stood up and the other sheaves bowed to him. Uh, the sun, moon, and stars bowed to him. He's 17, but God gave him a dream. It's a dream that his life could be distinct, 
that someday, if you'll do it right, if you'll have a long obedience in the same direction, someday people will bow down to you. He's 17. Then his brothers hated him. You know the story? Sold him to slave traders. He left everything he knew in life on the back of a slave wagon. In Egypt, they would have stripped him naked and put him on an on a auction block, and he was purchased by a guy and probably put to work in the fields. It's a long obedience in the same direction. And then he's running the estate, and then the guy's wife lied and said he tried to rape her, and they threw him in jail. He bounced on that slave wagon and had the dream from God when he was 17, and now he's 30, and he's in prison. When Pharaoh had a dream, the king of Egypt could not interpret it. And somebody remembered, there's a Hebrew guy down there who interprets dreams and they brought him out and he interpreted the dream and gave the solution. And on that day, he became prime minister. And when he rode down the street, everybody bowed down to him. A long obedience in the same direction. You think maybe when his brothers hated him and sold him and he's on the slave wagon, he could have said, what kind of a God is this? If God was really on my side, this wouldn't be happening to me. He would have been wrong. When he stood naked on a slave auction and was purchased by the head of the CIA, Secret Service, and FBI under Egypt, if God were really with me, this would, he would have been wrong. When he's working in the fields and cleaning the muck out of the stable. And then when Potiphar's wife lied and he ended up in jail, he could have said, see, God is not, he would have been wrong. It's a long obedience in the same direction. And if I know one thing about Joseph, it's this, he never lost his dream. The dream that God gave him when he's locked to your age, he kept it all the way through his life and it all came to pass. Closing thoughts, don't lose your dream. I beg you guys, whether you're young or whether you're older, in your marriage or what, don't lose your dream. It's a long obedience in the same direction. Success in life doesn't depend on being perfect. Success in life depends upon how you handle discouragement. So, we're going to close. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand and I'm going to say a prayer and I'm gonna get out of your way. Maybe you would like to take a few steps and get on your knees before that God you were singing about and say, oh God, you've got my life. It's a long obedience in the same direction. I may get discouraged, but I will not quit. I will realize what I owe you for that cross you were singing about and you've chosen me and made me special. It's a long obedience in the same direction. Let's stand together. And our heads bowed. And right this moment, if God is talking to you, would you step out and head this way? You don't need to talk to me. You don't need to talk to anybody unless you need help in your life. Would you step out and say, I've got a dream. God's given me a dream. I'm not going to lose my dream. It's a long obedience in the same direction. And come and just get on your knees before a holy God and say, God, I'm yours. I'm yours. It's a long obedience in the same direction. Father, thank you for taking us all through Jeremiah and let us know we don't give up. We don't quit. We don't fall by the wayside. God, there's a lot of young people that just like Jerry Thorpe when I first came to High Street that you can take their lives and use them. I pray they will give you everything they are and we will thank you in Christ's name. Now, would you like to come right now? Just step out and come this way and just say to the Lord, I'm yours. It's a long obedience in the same direction. Would you come?